Why should we use virtual private networks? Sometimes it's important to allow a user who's working outside of the organization's physical building and networks to access resources that are within this area without reducing their level of security. Employees sometimes work from home, many work while traveling on business, and even the occasional emergency may require an employee to need access to these internal resources. By implementing a VPN, the organization can help ensure their information assets are protected from outside attacks while allowing those remote users to work as if they were on site. A virtual private network uses encryption technology to create a secure connection between two points, whether between a client and a network or between two networks. Over the internet, IPsec, the IP security protocol, allows this communications to occur by encrypting the traffic and either embedding it in normal internet routed packets or by using secure endpoints. The first VPN technique involves two networks that need to communicate with each other either temporarily or persistently. Using IPsec tunnel mode, two VPN servers are set up to communicate with each other. Any traffic that is destined for the other network is first encrypted and then embedded in a packet that is addressed by one VPN server for the other. It's like putting a letter inside of a package and mailing the package to another zip code where the letter is taken out and delivered to its final address. While being transported over the internet, the user's entire packet is encrypted and thus unreadable, including its destination address. Only the IP address of the endpoint VPN servers is visible. This is also known as a point-to-point -point VPN. From the user's perspective, the client-to-network VPN works like signing into any regular server. They activate a piece of software and then log in with their credentials. The software establishes a connection with the destination network and downloads a session key used to encrypt communications for that session and only for the duration of that session. The key is then used to encrypt the traffic between the user and the network but it stores the encrypted data within normal IP packets so that they may be routed over the internet normally. The user is even assigned a temporary IP address within the organization's networks to facilitate communication. This is referred to as transport mode VPN. As with any new technology, the organization needs to begin with some important policies. At a minimum, there should be a VPN ISSP to describe what the users can and cannot use the technology for. This should then be accompanied by the guidelines, procedures, and standards described earlier. There will most likely also be a managerial SysSP that instructs the VPN administrator on how to physically configure the VPN endpoints. Finally, there will be technical SysSP configuration rules within the VPN that are also referred to as system policies. A critical policy that should work hand-in-hand -hand with the VPN policy is the mobile device policy. A mobile device or mobile computing policy should regulate the use of company-issued and or personal technology on company networks. Why is this important? We've become reliant on technology to help us in new ways. When you use your computer, do you allow your computer or web browser to remember your login credentials? That may be perfectly acceptable on a computer that never leaves the office, but when it's on a laptop you're taking on a business trip or a personal device, you're introducing new vulnerabilities. Suppose you lose your laptop or mobile phone, or it's stolen. Anyone who finds the technology may be able to get into it and would then have a secure connection inside the organization's network. They would bypass the firewall protections because your device remembered your credentials, which the attacker could then use. So the organization needs a policy that prohibits saving company credentials on mobile technology. It should also consider multi-factor authentication, as I'll discuss later. So that if you do forget and allow your laptop or mobile phone to remember your VPN credentials, at least an attacker won't be able to access the internal networks 
Unless, of course, your authentication also goes to your mobile phone, which is something else to consider. There are other issues to consider when implementing VPNs. Some of these issues are related to firewalls as well. First, are you using a VPN feature on a firewall's device? Many modern firewalls have VPN functions built in. That's great until the traffic on the firewall and or the VPN begin to affect its operation. And it also creates a bigger target for attackers. A denial of service attack on the firewall also affects VPN users and vice versa. Some VPN appliances also have firewall functions. Since the two technologies are so often combined, it becomes difficult to know whether it's a firewall with VPN capabilities or a VPN with firewall capabilities. It really boils down to the primary purpose of the device. If you're using filtering functions with your VPN appliance, the same concerns we just mentioned apply here as well. If the organization is setting up a combined firewall VPN device, it's best to perform the firewall functions first, then process VPN traffic, as this can drop damaged packets, preventing the VPN operation from trying to decrypt bad packets. The use of separate devices for firewalls and VPN operations does allow a reduced load on both devices. The computing functions associated with the VPN encryption and decryption do place a large demand on the devices. By separating the two and putting rules on the firewall to direct VPN-based traffic to the VPN appliance early in the rules, but after rules to filter out damaged or malicious traffic, can improve the operation of the network perimeter. VPNs are complex systems. If they are not properly configured, they can actually dramatically slow down network traffic, negatively impacting overall functions. They could also allow attackers to bypass firewall functions if they're not able to effectively implement their user validation, making sure the user is who they claim to be. VPNs are also limited by the same constraints of their configuration and capabilities as firewalls and other security technologies. VPNs are not creative and generally cannot make sense of human actions outside the range of their rules and programming. VPNs deal strictly with the patterns of network traffic they review, which is also known by attackers. At their heart, VPNs are computers and thus prone to the same errors, flaws, and vulnerabilities. VPNs are designed to function within the limits of their software and hardware and can only respond to patterns of events that occur in a certain way. VPNs are built, configured, and used by people and are subject to human error themselves. In the next lecture, I'll discuss cryptography and network security.